This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. Today we're going to do some listener question and answer, a little Q&A. And if you want to participate uh, in these in the future, be sure and follow me at Jack Carr USA on the social channels, Instagram in particular for these questions, and Danger Close Podcast, at Danger Close Podcast on Instagram as well. I think that's where we grabbed the questions from. And I gave them a quick skim before I ran in here because I wanted to grab a couple uh, a couple things and I'll talk about those when I when I get to them. But uh, let's do this. All right, here we go. The first one, would love to hear about TACMED, tactical medicine, training in the SEAL teams. Uh, love that you mentioned the stuff in the James Reese storylines and would like to hear more about yours and your teammates' experiences in training and applications in the real world. Uh, it's uh, bread and butter here in the civilian responsibility armed citizen world. And we get a lot of guidelines from Military Tactical Medicine. And that is from Iron Forge Consulting Group on Instagram. Awesome. Yeah, the tactical medicine stuff obviously evolved quite a bit uh, in the years following uh, following September 11th, 2001. Uh, up until that point, we were doing a lot of IVs, uh, a lot of IVs uh, as we were putting pressure situations like the back of a Pavlo helicopter. I remember doing that in Florida once with a, a little red lamp, red headlamp and kind of holding that red lamp, red headlamp down at the side uh, instead of the light directly on it. Uh, it was supposed to help. Uh, so I remember doing that. And then we're always doing it as we're running an obstacle course or as we're out at desert warfare training in Nyland or wherever. Um, we're always practicing those sticks. Uh, and then a lot of that went away after September 11th and uh, became more about stuffing that wound, getting that tourniquet on there and then getting them to that next level of care. But uh, there's what's great is that there are so many different companies out there that are training in uh, in trauma, tactical medicine, that sort of thing these days. Thunder Ranch has a, has a trauma course that uh, is awesome. Uh, Fieldcraft Survival, based here in Heber, Utah, with Mike Glover. They have an amazing course as well. Multiple courses out there as well, and they have a ton of great information on their website and on their social channels. So uh, be sure and follow Fieldcraft Survival and follow uh, Thunder Ranch Inc. Um, but, uh, Mike Glover puts a lot of stuff on his personal one as well. So check that out. And I'm going to get back in there too. Cause it's been, it's been a while, but every time I go to Thunder Ranch, uh, Heidi Smith makes me show her, uh, what tourniquet I'm carrying and then makes me put it on under stress in uh, in a certain amount of time and times me and, uh, make sure all my stuff is, is set up correctly and all that. So, um, yeah, and there's a lot of great companies out there that have, trauma kits that have uh, tourniquets and other things that uh, that you're you're going to need if you want to be prepared. Uh, we have tourniquets all over the place. I have them in the backpack that I carry every day and all the cars, uh, drawers around this house. So there's uh, always uh, a tourniquet very close at hand. So um, yeah, the good news is there's some wonderful companies, both on the training side and then with the gear side as well, that can uh, can set you up. And as you know, it's a uh, it's a lifelong journey. So we're always trying to uh, to to learn, to adapt, to build uh, whatever foundation that we have going forward. So uh, very cool. Thanks for the question. All right. Here we go. We hear a lot about your favorite books and films. What about music? Top three musicians, artists. Can't wait till in the blood. Awesome. In the blood coming May, 2022. And that's from the Kyle cometh on I G. Uh, yeah. You know, I, these days it's mostly when I get into the car, I have a podcast going. So I'm always listening to a, uh, to a podcast these days. Rarely do I turn on uh, music anymore. I probably should more often just to take a breath and relax and, uh, and not be constantly go, go, go all the time. But I'm always trying to catch up on my friends' podcasts or uh, the other podcasts I find interesting with guests. And it's just, yeah, there's so many options out there that are keeping me learning and engaged all the time. It's, uh, and it was funny is that when I, when I first heard about podcasts, I was like, who is going to want to sit and listen to two people talk for like five hours or two hours or whatever it was at the time. And then of course, now I have this. Uh, <laughs> that was like 10 years ago when the when they first came out, when I first heard about them. Uh, I think they came out on like some update with the iPhone. I was like, what's a podcast? Um, but now, now we all know. Um, so interesting. So for the terminal list, um, the uh, Johnny Cash song, uh, when the man comes around, that was kind of the inspiration that I had in my head as I was writing the first novel. And I actually took 
parts of that song. And in the original manuscript that I sent off to Simon and Schuster, each part, the, the prologue, each of the parts, and then the epilogue had a different stanza from that song in there to set the tone. And I, uh, of course, well, not of course, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, I guess you have to get permission from the Johnny Cash estate to be able to use that. Um, and I think that's pretty expensive to do. So those did not make it into the terminal list, into the uh, into the book. But uh, but at the beginning, uh, the quote that does set the tone for the whole, whole thing um, says, there's a man going around taking names. And I was allowed to use that because it came from an unknown, uh, I think even an anonymous source back in the 1800s. So you, it wasn't uh, credited to anybody. Johnny Cash used it in the song, of course, which is probably how it's most well known. Uh, but doing the research, uh, we were able to use that. Simon and Schuster's lawyer said that uh, uh, I could put that in there because it anyway legally I could put it. So that so that's the uh, the quote. So it comes from a song. Um, so there's been music that inspires, uh, a lot of the novels. I don't listen to music as I'm writing. I like it to be quiet as, as I'm writing with no distractions. doesn't matter what's around me. Really. I don't need a good view. don't need anything on the walls or whatever else. I just need quiet and uninterrupted time. Um, so yeah, but, uh, music wise, yeah, I like country. I like, uh, Texas country. I like, uh, grew up in the eighties, of course. So Hey, you know, eighties music. Yeah. And then, uh, back then growing up, I liked the sixties stuff, uh, and the seventies stuff in the eighties as well. So, um, I remember listening to a lot of, a lot of Bob Dylan and really getting into those lyrics for a while. But, uh, these days I'd toss on some, uh, some country, uh, then yeah. So that's the music side of the house. All right, here we go. What was the craziest situation you were in that somehow inspired a book, written or still concept? Another great question there. Uh, and that is from uh, CN, or CN Campus James on IG. So thank you so much for the question. Um, cra- There's a lot of crazy situations. Uh, the second novel was uh, True True Believer was inspired by some time I spent working for the, the CIA in Baghdad in 2006. So if you've read that novel, you you know where that inspiration comes from. Um, and uh, there are some cer- certain situations in the first novel that I fictionalized uh, a bit. There's a, a part where uh, James Reese is talking about how he has somebody uh, in his, in his sights. Um, anyway, if you've read the novel that came from, uh, in the book, I said it was in Fallujah in real life. It happened in Najaf. But for the most part, I take the feelings and emotions behind certain events that I was involved in. And I take those feelings and emotions and apply them to a completely fictional narrative. So that's what I'm mostly taking instead of an actual experience and then just dropping it into a fictional novel. It's mostly those feelings that I'm taking and applying them to fictional scenarios, like what it feels like when James Reese, my protagonist, my main character, when he's in an ambush. I remember what it was like in Baghdad in 2006 um, to be in an ambush. And I take those feelings and then I apply them to the fictional narrative. So I think really that's what made the book stand out to Simon & Schuster, who sees thousands of these books come across their desks every year. Um, and I think that's what made, um, uh, this book, the terminal list, uh, and it's continued with, with the others really stand out, um, is that the feelings that the main character feels come from a real place. So thank you for the question. Let's see three dream dinner companions, living or dead, who would they be? And that's from, uh, TJ Peck seven on Instagram. Uh, three dinner companions. Uh, first one would be my grandfather and he was killed in world war II. killed off Okinawa in 1945. He was a pilot. Uh, so I would sit down with him. I'd love to have met him. Uh, I'd love to meet him, sit down, have dinner. Um, he was just such an inspiration in my life, even though obviously never knew him. Um, I, I had his, his medals. I had his silk maps they used to give aviators back then. Uh, they were silk because if you hit the water in your plane and you had paper maps, they would disintegrate, obviously, uh, in the water. So they had silk. Um, uh, his wings, pictures of him and his squadron, old black and white photos. So I grew up with all that, and I think it made an impression. I think there was something in me, innate, uh, in the DNA that drove me to military service, but, uh, but also having uh, that connection to my grandfather through those objects um, was was powerful and impactful. So uh, he would be one for sure. And then, uh, gosh, there's so many. So I know I'm going to go back in this question and I'm going to, I'll be, it'll keep me up at night because I'll be like, oh man, I should have said this or that. But uh, maybe Teddy Roosevelt, I think sit down with him, uh, go on a hunt with him maybe. And then we're actually members of a, uh, or 
he, he was a original member of a, uh, a hunting club that I'm involved with. So I think, uh, sitting down with him after a hunt, sharing, uh, sharing a meal of wild game would be pretty cool. And I think Mark Twain, I mean, how about both at the same time? How about Teddy Roosevelt, Mark Twain together at dinner? That would be pretty amazing, um, for a lot of reasons, but <laughs> I think those would be the three, uh, off the top of my head anyway. Uh, okay. Jack, what books do you read your kids? All right. So I read, I skimmed this, like I said beforehand, and then I ran up to the kids' rooms and I grabbed a bunch of books off the shelf. So I don't want this to turn into an entire podcast on children's books, which it totally could. And I'll probably do a blog on that at some point. But um, depending on what age you're talking about, I'm going to run through the ones I grabbed anyway. And I couldn't find my side of the mountain. My side of the mountain, I, I found the second, third, fourth. Uh, I think there's four or second. Anyway, there's a couple other books out there that, uh, but my side of the mountain was the first one. I think there's two others. Um, and that was, I remember my mom reading that to me as a kid. I read it to my kids. Uh, and today you're dealing, you're competing today with so many other distractions. I mean, back in the eighties, we had, uh, even, you know, seventies for some of these books when I was really young, um, uh, or some books that I remember my mom and dad reading me, there weren't as many other distractions out there. There weren't as many other options. There was a TV that had, you know, four channels. Um, today, gosh, there's so many distractions for kids. So I read to my kids from like day one in the crib all the way up till they got a little too old for it. Uh, and that's just like my parents did with me and books have been obviously something that are very near and dear to me. My mom, uh, was a librarian. My dad encouraged reading, uh, and we were always surrounded by books. So it was very natural. So, uh, I encourage everybody out there to have these books around, even if the kids are distracted by these other things these days, make it natural to have books as a part of their life. And uh, for our kids, I'm hoping that maybe audiobooks are that uh, that gateway to actual books, um, just because of um, their, anyway, being attached to these devices and, and all that sort of a thing. So, uh, but here's a couple, um, like maybe sixth grade or so, The Tracker, uh, Tom Brown Jr. And yes, if you go online, you will find um, some things about this and, and, uh, and him, but hey, so you don't need to tell me in the comments or you can feel free to tell me, but I remember reading this in about sixth grade or so. And, uh, it was very impactful, maybe seventh grade. I, I forget exactly, but, uh, it was awesome. So read it for, for what it is and enjoy. Um, what else here? Uh, lost in the Barrens, Farley Mowat. I think the same thing. I'd say this is about a fifth grade, um, reading maybe fourth, fifth, sixth, depending on, on reading level and interest. But, uh, I remember this, Awesome right here. Um, but uh, other Farley Mowat stuff is, is great as well. This one, oh, I want to handle this. I should have gloves on. Ooh, the Hardy Boys Handbook, Seven Stories of Survival. Awesome. I forget what year I got this. Um, maybe it says in here. 1980. It says in here. And it says... Merry Christmas, 1980. So, um, <laughs> from my aunt. Um, but yeah, I still have it all these years later. The binding's coming apart. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, but this was cool. So, uh, what great, what is, how old was I in 1980? I was not old. I was five or six. Um, so yeah, very cool. Um, that was one hatchet, of course. Yeah. Uh, and Gary Paulson passed away this last, uh, last year. Um, and, uh, but hatchet is, and this is they a bunch of different formats. This is a hard cover. There's a bunch of paperback formats as well. So yeah, hatchet. Awesome. Uh, you know, comic books. What a great way to introduce kids to reading. Uh, this is a bunch of G.I. Joe comic books that were put into a, uh, a paperback. I think it's like the first year of G.I. Joe maybe or something like that. But uh, yeah, every kid is going to have a different path to reading. The important thing is sitting down and doing it uh, with my rifle by my side. Yep. Here we go. Um written by Kimberly Joe Cmac, illustrated by Donna Goodnas. Um, so a second amendment lesson. Oh yeah. So there, there's so many other influences that kids are going to have these days, no matter what we do as parents. But, uh, so it's important to get some of these other ones, um, in their hands as well. And it's tough to find some like pro hunting ones. This is Connor's big hunt by Sean Meyer. So, you know, this is like, you know, you read it when they're in like, when they're four, five, six, that, that sort of an age probably. So right there, uh, this one's interactive, another hunting one, Drake's adventures. And you open it up and you have, uh, you can press buttons and get like call turkeys and, and stuff like that. So there's that one. And I'm going to go pretty quick here because there's a lot gun book for girls. And just in case gun book 
The boys. Oh yeah. So those are from uh, uh, Shooting Sportsman's books right there. So let's I'll put these there. Um, Action Bible. So, you know, for, for kids, especially, this is like a comic book right here with different Bible stories in there. Uh, obviously a lot of lessons, uh, a lot of history, obviously. Um, and it's important to to know those. So even if you're reading it, not uh, as a religious text, but just as an action adventure, um, uh, learning about morals, learning about ethics, uh, and yeah, having that, that connection um, to the past. So bam, action Bible. Here's another one. So these are some of the ones they take uh, classics and they make them readable for younger kids. So uh, they're called classic starts, call of the wild. So I'd say this is probably like a fourth grade, maybe reading level. Um, and they can get into some, some classics and, but not get bogged down in the actual ones, especially if it's like the Iliad, the Odyssey or something like that. They make some that are more digestible for, for younger readers. Uh, here's another one, different, uh, Bible right here, illustrated Bible. So a little bit, uh, you know, less comic booky, but still has some, some pictures in there. Um, and then they can think back on, uh, different, different stories and have a little bit of a foundation there. So there's that. Uh, here's another one, classic, classic starts, Greek myths. Uh, here's one, uh, The Book of Virtues for Young People by William Bennett. Mm -hmm. uh, I grabbed this one, Jocko's Way of the Warrior Kid. I mean, it's hard to find good uh, modern books uh, these days, and Jocko's are obviously fantastic, um, getting kids on the path early. So there's that. Uh, and then for younger kids, here is Mikey and the Dragons, also by Jocko. So younger kids here, obviously. Um, here growing up, Henry the Explorer, just, uh, cool, inspires younger kids to, to get outside. And, and, uh, I just love these growing up. So I put that in there as well. Uh, giving tree. Oh, and it's hard to read this without getting sentimental right here, but there's, you know, the classics, uh, as well. So that's that. And then the daring book for girls. And I think we have a daring book for boys. I was looking for it, but I couldn't find it when I ran out there and was, it was looking, but, uh, I think we have maybe three of these daring book for boys, daring book, uh, for girls. And then one other one. So, um, some cool stuff in here. So there we go. A few, uh, from ages like, you know, kindergarten through fifth grade there, some, some options. All right, here we go. What do you consider your greatest accomplishments and why? Um, you know, it wouldn't even be my accomplishment. Um, I think it's uh, my wife and our family uh, coming together to uh, to raise a, a special needs child. Our middle child has some really severe special needs and uh, needs 24-7 full-time care forever. So I think I am most proud of uh, how we've dealt with that, but mostly how the other kids and my wife um, have dealt with that and uh, deal with it every single day. So um, that would be that. Uh, what pieces of advice would you give to the next? And that was from, uh, Kelly Slayton on IG. Uh, uh and, oh, and the book one was from full three, zero, five, five, six. Ooh, five, five, six. Nice on IG. Okay. This next one, what pieces of advice would you give to the next generation of combat leaders, war fighters, and intelligence officers? And that's from jab cat seven, six, two. Nice. We had a five, five, six and a seven, six, two. I like this, uh, on Instagram. So, uh, yeah, the importance of trust, how important that is both up and down the chain of command and to the sides with your peers, uh, and how everything matters. Uh, every single interaction is an opportunity to build and continue building that trust. So establishing it and building it, whether it's a it's two minute conversation in the hallway at the, the SEAL team or wherever you're, you're working. Um, and, that that's an opportunity to build trust as is every single brief, as is every single time you run the obstacle course, as every single time you go out and hit the range. Um, and more important as a leader, the times where you don't have to go out there and do those things, but you do anyway, and you perform because these guys are always judging, always watching. Uh, and that's why it's so important to get out there and to perform at a high level. And, you know, as a, as a, a SEAL leader, yeah, you want to be up there near the top um, as a shooter, as a runner, as a swimmer, running the obstacle course. Um, and then you have to make great decisions, obviously, uh, when you're doing your tactical training and maneuvering the guys on the battlefield. So, uh, but everything, no matter how small it is, is an opportunity to build trust. Um, so that'd probably be what I'd pass along. Everything matters. There's not one 
interaction that does not matter. Every single thing you do as a leader, really as a, as a human and a citizen matters. So uh, that would be that. All right, next one. You've got a bug out and you can bring one M4, one pistol and one bolt gun. Which three would you select and why? And that's from C. Kirk for Bama on IG. Yeah, I think the hardest part is going to be deciding um, as I as I have to leave the house and, and bug out. Um, but I have a lot of M4s to choose from. Luckily, I would probably grab one that has uh, magne- magne- uh, an optic on it, not just a not just a red dot. Maybe some magnification in there. Uh, the one that Sig just got the the contract with the with the Army for to replace the ACOG uh, is probably the one I would do because it's a it's adjustable as that throw lever on there. Um, and I'm about to drop that onto a Bravo Company AR here shortly as soon as I come up for breath. But uh, so it really doesn't matter the M4 exact one. There's so many great M4 platforms out there. Uh, Sig makes great ones. Jana Defense makes great ones. Bravo Company makes great ones. Um, there's so many different companies out there. But what I put on each one is some sort of an optic, whether it's a red dot optic uh, or it's a scope, um, uh, a sling and a light. So those are the three things that I would make sure it has. Uh, and backup irons, of course, as well, especially if you're bugging out, um, maybe take some extra batteries. Um, so that would be the M4. Uh, one pistol, if it's bug out, I'll probably grab something a little bigger than the P365 SIG or the 365 XL. Probably grab the 320, uh, one of the 320s <laughs> that are uh, available here. Um, so something a little bigger, you know, nine mil. And then uh, what are the, bolt gun. So bolt gun, uh, once again, a lot of choices, but I'm probably going with the one that is my go-to uh, 301 mag uh, rifle zinc because it's very light. I have a Swarovski optic on that thing. Um, and it's just, I've used it so much over the years. It's kind of my go-to hunting rifle. You can go to my Instagram or go to my um, my website and, and scroll down to a blog, a recent blog from Alaska where I went on a moose hunt and check out a little more, bit more about it there. But um, yeah, uh, optic on there, best glass that, uh, that, that you're capable of putting, putting on there, but there's so many great bolt guns out there on the market these days. You certainly don't need to to spend what I spent on the, um, uh, on the rifles ink. Uh, you can get something great out of the box. Uh, Tika makes great stuff out of the box. Seiko, um, uh, we use those at it at, um, uh, pineapple brothers in, in Hawaii where I'm part of a hunting operation out there. Uh, those are available for clients that go out there. They're all cited in by uh, an FTW ranch with a range card and all that sort of a thing. So clients can come out and just dial and go. But uh, but there's so, yeah, so many great, great ones out there. But those would probably be the, the three off the top of my head that I grab um, just because, yeah, I use it. And the cross also, the one right behind me, it's, uh, it's not out in Magnum calibers yet. I I think there's maybe some plans to do that. I'm not sure, but, um, so that's a, a 6.5 right there. Um, but that thing is awesome as well. But I think for this, when you're asking me this, I M4, so we got the five, five, six right there, pistol nine mil, and then uh 300 wind mag for the bolt gun. So you can kind of cover some different ranges right there. Um, yeah. And I probably grab a shotgun just, you know, uh, why not? 870. Awesome. I uh, have a couple 870s uh, or like a Benelli M1 Super 90. Uh, what is it now called? The Benelli uh, M4. Uh, I think it is. I got to get one of those, but uh, or auto loader. So uh, something like that as well. So with both double lot and slugs. Yeah. I've just been writing a, uh, a portion of In the Blood that has some shotgun action in there for the uh, for the shotgun fans out there. Yeah, my last time to actually go into a course with that uh, Benelli M1 Super 90, uh, it's been a while, but I wanted to make sure because in the SEAL teams, we use them mostly for breaching. Um, so I wanted to get back on the, the, the shotgun more, using it like a, like a rifle and uh, using it as a, you know, for something other than breaching. So awesome. Okay. Again, every American I think needs a, like an, definitely need an 870, definitely need some sort of a 1911 for sure. Good to have a polymer frame handgun as well, but just as an American, we kind of have this affinity to, to a 1911, to, uh, to the 870 and to some sort of a pre-64 Winchester, like a 3030. So those are, uh, those are ones that I think are, are good for every American's gun safe. All right, here we go. Next one, Basil Hayden's or Jim Beam Black. And this is from Milkman Actual on IG. You know, I never had Jim Beam Black. I had Jim Beam, obviously, but uh, never had the Jim Beam Black. But because you brought it up, 
I'm going to get some the next time I uh, am in the vicinity of the liquor store and give it a shot. Uh, Bay Lane's not bad. So that's a, that's a good one. We just, I was just drinking some the other night, actually. Um, but yeah, obviously I'm a fan. I got some, um, uh, what do I have here? I have some Hoot & Young whiskey right here, two Delta guys that started a uh, uh, whiskey bourbon company when they got out of the military. Uh, High West, got a Midsummer Night's Dream over there. I like their Rendezvous Rye quite a bit. And uh, what do I have over here? Alpine Distilling. Got uh, They have a bunch of great stuff as well. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. All right, let's see. Which Solomon boots did you wear downrange? Were they tactical or just hiking? From Rooster Lombard on IG. Yes. Awesome. Solomon. Whoa. Got, books are falling. That's all right. That's all right. We'll adjust. We'll adjust. Um, so these, I went and grabbed, because I gave this a skim. Uh, I went and grabbed these from the front of the house. And these are the quests. So right here, uh, I'm not sure what year the quest came out, but I think I started wearing these in about 2008, maybe 2007, um, somewhere along. So as, as soon as I wore the quests, then uh, that was it. I was, I was in. Uh, and you can tell these ones are pretty worn, a little dirty right there. So I love these. Um, and yeah. And actually when I trail run or when I, I got to get back to trail running. So 2022, I'm getting back in shape. This has been a busy year. A couple of things fell off the plate, like uh, staying in shape, sleeping and eating. Right. But uh, 2022 coming at you hard and I actually like running in these things. And I think that probably comes from running the obstacle course, uh, both in buds. And then when you're in the SEAL teams as well, and uh, running that obstacle course with a little bit of uh, protection on your ankle. So, so I do like to actually run in these as well. And I use these for everything, uh, unless I need a little more ankle support. Like if I'm going in on a hunt where I'm planning on coming out a little heavier than I went in, then, uh, then I go with something, uh, stiffer, uh, leather from Schnee's. But, uh, but these are like my go-to everyday type of a boot that, uh, that if I'm going a little bit lighter, I take these, uh, running the trails, hiking the trails. I just love these boots. So these are the quests right here. And, uh, and these are Awesome. Absolutely love them. Um, but yeah, when I started wearing boots, uh, non-military boots, I guess we we're always wearing non-military boots in the SEAL teams, uh, other than, than buds. But, uh, so, I, so it was less like some Merrill's earlier on, you know, as those evolved and then, you know, but there's some great boots out there, but as soon as I got to these, these became the go-tos. And then these are the ones that I wear like every day. And these are called, oh, it says right on there, the XA Pro 3D. Very nice of uh, Solomon to put that on there. I like that. So these are the ones I slide on every single day. Um, you can tell they're pretty beat up. That white stuff on there, that's uh, from painting targets at Terran Tactical. Got some, uh, instead of just spray painting, they have these buckets of paint and you just dip in. And anyway, it works pretty well, but it gets all over your pants and shoes uh, and it stains. So <laughs> those are the ones. These are my like everyday shoes right here. And Solomon was so awesome. They sent me a couple new shoes. They sent me these. So this is, I guess, a newer model, XA Pro 3D right here. So this is what it looks like clean. This is what it looks like dirty. This is what it looks like clean. So that's that. And then they sent me this one too. This is a new one, the XA Wild right here. Looks like that's Gore-Tex. So that's the XA Wild right there. So a new one. So I'll be wearing this soon. Look how clean. It's not going to remain that way. Very cool. All right. Here we go. Thank you, Solomon. And Solomon also has some great stuff, some layering system stuff on their website as well. If you're getting out there to uh, to ski this winter, whether it's uh, uh, skate skiing, you know, cross country skiing, or uh, you're out there on the mountain alpine, uh, you know, they have some really cool stuff out there. So, Solomon, thank you guys so much. Um, what else do we have here? What have you found to be the hardest part of the book writing process? And that's from Title Beard on IG. Um, not being interrupted. Uh, things got pretty busy around here uh, <laughs> over the last couple of years, but uh, that's the hardest part is really just uh, taking a breath and going all in. Uh, I take my phone, I leave it in the other room. I have a computer that is just dedicated to writing what doesn't have anything else on there. It's connected to the internet for updates and, and stuff like that, but, uh, but no email, nothing that's going to beep at me. So it's really that uninterrupted writing time and yeah, the hardest part of writing has been to, um, to block off that time, uh, because now we have the scripts for, uh, the terminal list series and, uh, that came, we finished 
filming that in uh, in August, but and in the script development, the screenwriting process was continuous. Like it's, uh, it was me and the showrunner, uh, at first and, uh, putting together the pilot episode, uh, me really just advising and, and learning. And then the writer's room came together and they put, uh, episodes together and I'd advise on those. And then it went back to me and the showrunner again, after the writing room disappeared. And then we, uh, kept tinkering with those. And then as it started, it's a continuous process of looking at those scripts because like with any plan situation and terrain, change some of that stuff up. So what you thought was going to work perfectly as you were writing in this temperature controlled uh, office, well, once you got out there and put it into practice, it uh, it didn't really work out that way because of terrain, weather, how the actors had, uh, had interpreted and played their characters up to a certain point. Certain things didn't play, didn't work anymore, and you had to evolve and adapt. So that was all uh, a part of it. So point being, there were a lot of other things to do other than, than write. So, uh, uh, that's the hardest part is fig for me anyway, is figuring out how to allocate my time appropriately, um, and not get, uh, pulled in a thousand different directions all the time. So, uh, it's going to be, I think a continual good problems to have, but, uh, I think it's going to be a continual thing that I, that I work on and, and, uh, but anyway, that's the hardest part. Because I love every part of the actual writing process, whether it's you know coming up with the idea, turning that idea into an outline, uh, writing, problem solving. Because really, what I'm doing on the page is I'm problem solving most of the time. I'm ag aggressively problem solving on the page, uh, just like you aggressively problem solve on the battlefield. Although here I can edit, I can sleep on it, I can come back to it. So um, uh, the consequences of making a mistake are a lot less dire. But um, yeah, so the hardest part of writing time allocation. Um, that's it. Uh, and with kids and family and all that stuff, you know, making sure that, uh, uh, that you're just doing it, doing it the right way. All right, here we go. Which of your novels is your favorite? Which was your favorite to write or research? Um, you know, it's interesting is that each and every one has been my favorite as I was writing it or researching it, um, or editing it. Uh, so yeah. And that's, that's just been how it, and to include this one right now in the blood. Um, cause last year I would have told you my favorite one was, uh, the devil's hand. Um, uh, took a lot more research for that one than I anticipated out of the gate because of the, uh, the biomedical research aspect of it. Um, the, the pandemic, uh, <laughs> that hit after I'd already started researching and writing. Um, so that was kind of, kind of crazy how that worked out, but each one has been my favorite as, uh, as I've written it. So I would guess that most authors would say their first one. Um, and it was for, for the longest time. And then it was the second one. And then it was the third one. And the third one, Savage Son, is something I wanted to write since I was in the sixth grade. So I've been thinking of writing that book since I was 11 years old, since I read The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. And uh, I always knew that one day I would write a modern day thriller that paid tribute to that short story. And Savage Son was that one. Uh, and initially out of the gate, it's the one I wanted to start with, but I knew that I, the characters weren't developed enough to be able to explore the themes of Hunter and Hunted um, through the uh, the the dark side of man through that dynamic. And, uh, so I had to start with the terminal list and then still at the end of the terminal list, they weren't quite ready. I had to go into true believer, have that journey of redemption and then savage son. Um, so anyway, each and every one has been my favorite as I've gone along And this one right now, uh, in the blood, that is a novel of violent resolutions. So, um, yeah, super excited uh, to finish that up and get it out there in 2022. Let's see. Uh, oh, and that was from, that was from Tommy Boucher on IG. All right. Best writing advice you've received. And that's from, uh, F H A K F H F H spear on Instagram. Nice handle. Love it. Um, best writing advice I have received. Um, the difference between a published author and an unpublished author is that the published author never quit. And uh, Brad Thor told me that a long time ago. Uh, I think another author had uh, had coined that phrase in the 70s, um, but I'm not not positive on that. I'd like to find out where it originated. But, uh, but that was a great one because it really spoke to me in the same way that uh, SEAL teams were a draw a lot because of uh, a lot of that's because of BUDS being so hard, uh, being touted as some of the toughest training ever devised by a modern military. At a young age, when I heard that back in the early 80s, they had me, I was, I was in. And hearing that SEALs were some of the uh, best special operators in the world, you know, when you're seven years old and you hear that, you're like, 
Roger that. I'm in. So, uh, and so not ringing that bell at Bud's, but now and not quitting, keep moving forward. So uh, I think same thing with writing. So hearing that advice, the only difference between a published author and, and an unpublished author is that the published author never quit. Uh, so that really spoke to me and I, I love that. It energized me, I think. Uh, the other one is, hey, make every single chapter as good as the first chapter. So I strive to do that in in all my novels, make each and every one as good as that prologue, as good as that chapter one, um, yeah, hopefully better as you go along. And then hopefully each book, you know, gets better as well as I further refine my craft and, and uh, evolve uh, over time. So hopefully that's how things are going. It's Jack Carr, and I am so fired up to be able to talk to you today about Aimpoint. I talk about Aimpoint all the time anyway. If you followed the novels, you know, they're on a bunch of the M4s that my protagonist, Navy SEAL sniper James Reese uses. Uh, and that might be because I used them in the military and out of the military still today. Amazing company, great people over at Aimpoint. They've been the leader in red dot site technology since 1975. So they know what they're doing, both on the tactical side of the house, citizen self-defense side of the house, hunting side of the house. Check out their website, Go to Aimpoint and check them out. They've got so many great things. But today, I'm going to talk about this. This is the Comp M5S right here, 2MOA. And uh, I love this thing because what does it take? A triple A. So for me, I love batteries that uh, can work on a whole bunch of different things from headlamps to your red dot optic to whatever. But you don't really need it for this because once you put one of these in here, it's five to eight years uh, that this thing is going to last turned on. So awesome. But uh, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I am a big proponent of putting a couple of things on your AR or really uh, any AR type weapon system that you're going to be using. Uh, one of those is a red dot. This is the micro from Aimpoint right here, but a red dot sight. Uh, magnifier is nice to have as well. Put the backups on there just in case. And of course, a light and a sling. So uh, if I was going to distill it down to just a couple things, Aimpoint red dot sight, light sling. So that is uh, a solid setup right there. But this one right here, so you can tell it is almost the same size as the micro, if you can see that, boom, right here. But the Comp M5S 2MOA, uh, this one is going on my future A. Ours. And I'm actually in the process of building one right now. When I finish my next novel, I'll take a breath and get that fully set up. But this is what is going on that rifle. And I've been using them obviously for uh, a long time. Uh, if you've read the novels or been following me on social channels or whatever it may be, but this, this is Afghanistan right there. And what is on my M4? That's right. An aim point. Hey, look at that beard. But, uh, and then this, some of you will recognize where this is taken also in Afghanistan, but the specific place. And you can see that right there. What's on the rifle. That's right. An aim point. So very cool. And aim points doing an awesome thing right now where you can get a signed copy of the devil's hand with any purchase of the comp M five S or a micro. So very cool. Check them out. Go to aimpoint.info slash Jack Carr, C A R R, uh, and use the checkout code Jack Carr. So if you want a signed copy, I get questions all the time about where they people can get signed copies of the novels. Well, you can get one at Aimpoint if you're setting up your rifle with uh, one of these two red dot optics. So awesome. AAA battery, amazing. Uh, super long lasting, obviously, huge benefits to that. And Aimpoint, trusted name in optics, reliable, proven, trusted. I am a huge fan of this company. Obviously, uh, I go back to my first novel, second novel, third novel, fourth novel, and hey, the fifth novel that I'm working on right now just happens to have an Aimpoint on it as well. So uh, check them out. Once again, aimpoint.info slash Jack Carr for details and use the code Jack Carr at checkout. So Aimpoint, thank you so much for all you have done for me over the years, for the military over the years. I think it's 1.5 million red dot optics that uh, are in use by the United States military right now. Um, obviously an incredible product uh, that you can trust, that I trust. So uh, thank you for all you do. And I am super fired up to get this on my next rifle build. All right, here we go. What 
were the most enduring lessons from your time in Knowles. And Knowles, N-O-L-S, is the National Outdoor Leadership School. I spent a semester with them up in Alaska um, before Buds. And uh, that was for, that's from All the Adventures. Oh, awesome, All the Adventures. Thank you. Um, you know, I think it was, I was, before then I was just training. A lot of the training that I did for the SEAL teams and just throughout my life was individual. Um, you know, you go out, you run by yourself, you go to the pool by yourself, you go to the gym by yourself. Um, at least back in the day, you know, there was nothing, there was no internet. So you couldn't log on and look up CrossFit or look up, you know, uh, Jim Jones or look up, uh, Navy SEAL workout regimens or anything like that. Um, there was no community on Instagram to, uh, to follow along and get it, draw inspiration from, or learn new techniques or what you should be doing before you go to Bud's. There was none of that. There was a couple magazine articles and some videos out there in the early eighties, mostly that focused on Vietnam. Um, but they showed some obstacle course stuff at one point. Um, they showed some, uh, some immediate action type drill stuff as well. Uh, and so I just saw guys doing pull-ups. So I did pull-ups. Uh, I switched my hands around because I saw that obstacle course. I threw a rope up in the tree uh, at our house and climbed that and swung on that and used a different rope to rappel with because I saw guys rappelling um, as well. So I just did the things that I saw in these still pictures from magazines like uh, like Gung Ho, for those of you who remember that one back in the day. I think it was a like a Soldier of Fortune type of a spinoff uh, from Soldier of Fortune magazine as well back in the day uh, from a couple of videos that were out there, Men with Green Faces. Um, so, so that sort of thing. There wasn't a, a book that you could get or a, uh, a website you could go to that told you what, what to do. Um, so, uh, point being a lot of what I did was individual. So I got up to Knowles and now it's not individual, but I was still thinking of it as training for buds, uh, for training for the SEAL teams. And I thought of mo a lot of things uh, throughout my life uh, through that same lens from a very early age. So if I was playing lacrosse, if I was playing soccer, if I was running cross country, um, if I was coming home from school and doing pull-ups in the backyard, I was always thinking, hey, how is this going to um, make me a better operator one day? Even at very early, a very early age. Um, so I got up to Knowles and Buds was on the horizon. It was, you know, maybe, what was it, a year, year and a half out or whatever it was. Um, but I was still thinking of this, hey, as training for making me a better operator one day. Um, but like in the first day, maybe second day, whatever it was. I mean, I was in pretty good shape back then. So I got out and I just started crushing. And uh, in that one, we had pretty heavy packs um, back then because you're going out for like 70 some days for semester and you're getting resupply to plane comes in with more food and, and that sort of a thing. But you still have leather boots, you have uh, plastic boots for uh, for glacial travel. Um, you have a lot of, lot of stuff on your back. And I was just like, all right, boom, this is part of training. And then, uh, but very quickly, it became apparent that this is about the team. This is a uh, a journey of yeah self exploration, but you're part of a team here, uh, and you're going to be in the backcountry with these people for uh, a long time for a semester. And uh, so it didn't take long to realize, oh, okay, this is not just about me putting weight in my pack and going as fast as I can to get to that next uh, destination um, on the on the map as we move here across this glacial or whatever it is. Um, so I think that'd be the biggest lesson is that uh, that wasn't about me. Uh, it's never about you. Um, it's about those around you and who you can influence, how you influence them. So I think that was probably the, the biggest lesson that I drew from, from Knowles. And what a great, what a great course. All right. What's then the most, oh, and on the, on the practical side, other than, <laughs> other than that, um, you know, I've been running through the Sierras and stuff with my, with my parents and, uh, from a very early age as well. And so, uh, having that recent experience in the backcountry uh, before buds and before getting my seal team, um, I was kind of shocked when I got to my team in the late nineties, um, with, with gear they were issuing, what gear they were issuing to send people to Alaska with, um, so anyway, I think I talked about it with John Barklow on the podcast that I did with him. Uh, he was a Navy diver at, at SEAL Team 5 with me. So I've known him for uh, well over 20 years now, but he went to Alaska for 10 years and helped uh, uh, essentially ran our cold weather warfare training facility in Alaska uh, for a decade. And 
just is an incredible guy. He works at Sitka now. Um, knowledgefromstorms.com is his website. You can follow him on Instagram as well to, to link to that. But he has so many lessons from being up there. But before he got there, you know, the stuff that they issued us was not good. It was not what you would want to take into the backcountry in Alaska. So luckily I had this foundation that I'd built through my entire life and more recent uh, experience in Alaska before I went to, to Buds and to, to the SEAL teams. Um, but anyway, it's important to get kids in the backcountry. Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, you know, one of the best things you can do. Unplug, get out there. You're going to learn some life lessons and it's going to be character building. All right. Uh, what's been the most surprising thing you learned about the whole process of getting the terminal list ready for Amazon Prime? And that's from MT Grizz on IG. Most surprising. I don't know about most surprising. I guess how collaborative it all is. Um, oh no, here it is. More recently, uh, getting going to the set, uh, seeing how good everyone is at their individual jobs. Um, they're so specialized and they're so good. I mean, they're operator tier one operators. Uh, cause if you're not, you're not going to last very long in, in Hollywood on a production of that scale. So we had 350 people working on set. Um, and now I understand why it's so specialized. Um, and why, if you go to plug something in, they're like, Oh no, you, that's somebody else's job. Um, because that is the most efficient way to run it. And seeing it, taking a step back, taking a breath and watching it happen um, is amazing. And seeing the director, you know, choreograph this whole thing. And I got so fortunate that Antoine Fuqua was up there and Chris Pratt, those two set the tone for everybody else. So that's like Antoine is like the, let's say the commanding officer of the SEAL team. Uh, Chris Pratt is like the troop commander at the SEAL team. And both of them are setting the tone for everything else that happens. And I can totally see how, if you had like a different director or different, uh, different leads up there, how things could go south in a hurry. And, uh, just so fortunate having Antoine, uh, and having Chris, and then each and every other director for every episode was of that same caliber. Like they were so awesome in setting that tone. There was no, you know, craziness, uh, going on. It was all just, uh, an amazing, experience. So, um, and everybody was so, so great at their jobs at every, every level. So that's probably the most surprising part. Cause I hadn't really thought about it at a time. Cause this was my first experience on, uh, on a set. Um, so I'd say that was, uh, that was, that was surprising only cause I hadn't thought of it before. Uh, the rest of it, how collaborative it all is, especially when you're dealing with the scripts and changes to the scripts and, and all those sorts of things. It's, uh, yeah, the collaborative nature of the process was amazing. And my experience was so good, but because it was so good, I can think, oh, I can see how this could really not be good uh, if you had different people in some of these positions. So once again, choosing that team. And then once you have that team together, uh, that leadership from David Agilio as the showrunner, from Antoine as the as the director and executive producer, uh, Chris Pratt as well, uh, from as lead actor and executive producer and his production company, like, and for making it, happen. Uh, and then having great people involved like Jared Shaw, who's the only reason that's happening because he gave Chris the book. Uh, and I was in the SEAL teams with, with Jared. And I've talked about that on a couple different podcasts and I'm going to get Jared on this. We've already talked about it. So now I've said it publicly. He doesn't have an IG, never going to have an Instagram. That's good. And, but, uh, he's going to come on the podcast and we're going to talk all about it. So that'll be awesome. And then Ray Mendoza, we had Ray out there. Also, I was in the SEAL teams with him. He was in Active Valor and he did the uh, technical advising um, for Lone Survivor um, with Peter Berg and that that crew. So um, yeah, uh, just had an, an, an incredible crew. Amazing experience. Uh, how does your writing process start? How do you organize your ideas? And that's from R1CHC, zero L-E on Instagram. Uh, it starts obviously with an idea, but then I take that idea and I turned it into like a one page executive summary. Um, and for some it's like, uh, two paragraphs, uh, a page, page and a half, but average one page executive summary, kind of like what you would read on a book jacket. If you're reading about a book, so idea I've turned it in. This is how it's been for all five novels to date. Um, so the four that are published and the one that I'm working on right now that I'm finishing up. Uh, so it's, that's how it's been. I don't know if it's always going to be that way, but that's how it's worked so far. So idea and concept theme, one page executive summary. And then I take that one page executive summary and turn it into, uh, an outline and that outline, uh, I get detailed enough. 
but not so crazy detailed that uh, I spend too much time trying to get the outline right and too much time trying to solve problems in the outline. So if I come to a portion of that outline where I'm like, oh, this isn't going to make sense. I'm going to figure this out. I don't spend the next week. I don't spend the next day. I don't spend the next month uh, worrying about that problem. I know that I have six months, seven months, eight months, um, year essentially total um, to figure that out. And I know that I'm going to figure that out because there's time. Um, so I don't let it let it uh, become an obstacle to me. I just go around over through and uh, continue going, put a couple X's on the page, knowing that I got to come back and, and solve it. But then I take that outline and then I start writing. And uh, as I write, I think of other things that I need to develop and I continually update that outline as I go um, until I get to like say the 75% mark, 80% mark, where it's not going to make sense to continue to do that. And then it's just all in the manuscript itself. So um, that's the, that's the process. All right. If you could witness any moment in time, which would it be and why? And that's from TJ Arias on IG. And I think it would be, man, signing the declaration. I think this one might keep me up as well. Cause I might, there's so, I mean, yeah. Um, if you followed me for a while, you know that I'm a history person. Um, but I'm going to say that because I'm an American. So I think signing the declaration of independence would probably, because those guys were risking everything to do that. Um, uh, yeah, their, their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor, they were risking it all so that we could have the freedoms that we have today. So we're the inheritors of that risk that those people took. And uh, we need to be good inheritors of that so we can pass those same freedoms on to the next generation. And uh, if you're listening to this, you probably know how I feel about that. Um, if you've read the, the, uh, the preface to the terminal list, you'll know how I feel about that. Um, and obviously those freedoms are, are under attack and they're under attack from, from within and oftentimes from institutions these days um, whose very livelihoods, very existence um, is due to those people signing the Declaration of Independence and developing that constitution and developing that Bill of Rights like the First Amendment. Um, we have actual, we have publications, we have journalists, we have authors um, calling for more restrictions on the First Amendment. Um, anyway, it's something to think about and something to, uh, to fight for. So we turn over to the next generation, the same options and opportunities that, uh, that we all had to, to make our own decisions in this life and in this country, um, and live with the consequences of those decisions, but, uh, to build whatever life we want, no matter where you start. Um, I was talking to someone the other day and I remembered that, uh, hearing Larry Ellison, uh, founder of Oracle say, um, that, uh, he had all the disadvantages necessary for success. Awesome. Awesome. Larry's an amazing guy. All right, here we go. Uh, that was that one. Just got a couple more, just a couple more. Uh, and remember, if you want to ask questions in the future, uh, definitely follow at Jack Carr USA and the Danger Close Podcast or at Danger Close Podcast uh, as well. And we'll do this again sometime if you like it. All right. Which other thriller character would James Reese work best with? Oh, man. Let's see. Put me on the spot. And that's from Peter Voskovich on IG. Man, Peter putting me on the spot. What other thriller characters would he work best with? The Gray Man, probably. Yes, by Mark Graney. Um, that's coming to Netflix, I think, in earlier or first half of 2022, I think. Uh, I know it's it's done filming, so that's a, that's a great series. Um, but uh, yeah, what other thriller characters? Probably... Yeah, a lot of them uh, in the genre. Uh, Scott Harvath, Mitch Rapp, um, uh, Jack Ryan, John Clark. Um, yeah, so probably, yeah, probably uh, work work well with uh, any of those guys who have uh, skill sets that uh, would be complementary in uh, taking out enemies of the nation. So very cool. All right. Uh, what degree or field did you pursue prior to enlisting? Did you learn anything that translated to NSW or your current career? And that's Matt.Starman on IG. Um, I did uh, justice studies criminology because I thought that had might have something to do with my future path in life. Um, always been a reader, but really what I wanted to do was just get to the SEAL teams um, as soon as I possibly could. So, um, uh, but the, the criminology side of the house interested me, uh, back then in the nineties, I didn't know if I was going to stay or 
you know, you never really know if you're going to make it through <laughs> SEAL training. That's why you're going there to test yourself in the first place. But uh, I didn't know, hey, was that going to translate at some point into hostage rescue team, into working at the CIA somewhere um, or something something like that. So, uh, and I've always been interested also in the law, um, uh, probably for a variety of reasons, um, because it's so tied to the history of this nation, obviously based on British common law. And uh, uh, it, it's so important to, the future. Um, there's a great book called Three Felonies a Day. It's been on my uh, reading list a couple times now. I do a monthly reading list. Go to officialjetcar.com and you can scroll through those and check those out. But Three Felonies a Day by Harvey Silverglate. And he talks about how, hey, the normal person in this country these days wakes up, goes to work, comes home, has dinner, tucks the kids into bed. And unbeknownst to that person, um, uh, throughout the day, they have committed three felonies. It's just because of the way laws are written, how they're interpreted. They're written very broadly, they're written very, very broadly by design. Um, so anyway, it's just something, once again, be an educated citizen. An educated citizenry is uh, a dangerous citizenry to uh, the establishment, to the established, maybe tyrannical type of a government. Be educated, um, why some of these laws exist, uh, their history, um, why they're written so broadly and be skeptical of any new laws that uh, are added to the books. And they're added to the books. The, you, the American Bar Association can't even tell you how many laws are on the books. You can't count them. There are too many laws on the books, um, which gives the government, uh, a reason almost to come after every single one of us. Something to think about. All right. Will there ever be a Thomas Reese origin story like Clancy did with John Clark and without remorse? And that's from Michael Hedberg on IG. Great question. So I did that on purpose. I dropped little hints here and there uh, about more than a hint on uh, Thomas Reese, but uh, even had Reese's grandfather in there, a little hint about uh, about him. So, and then on the uh, the Hastings side of the house also, I've dropped little uh, little hints about that, uh, uh, that, that background uh, as well. So I think it would be fun to explore some of that at some point. I have no immediate plans uh, to do so. I'm just trying to uh, yeah, figure out yeah, a schedule that allows me to, there's so many things that I want to do. Uh, I have this whole list of, uh, of things, this whole, uh, that I want to do a strategic plan of all these other things I want to do. Um, but, uh, and that's on there, but I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but, uh, but yeah, I, it's something that I do think about. All right. Next one. Uh, and the last one, it says uh, true believer has a focus on African anti-poaching. How can American get involved help? And that's from Bud, Bud, M-E-H-M on I-G. Thank you for that question. Um, so I did go over for the research for both uh, True Believer um, and for a Savage Son. I went to Mozambique for uh, for True Believer. Um, and then I went later, I went to South Africa for to, to help train up an anti-poaching unit over there. And I got, oh, it was so amazing. You can go back in my Instagram or uh, I think I wrote a blog article about it too, but uh, it was so amazing to go there. I learned so much more from them than they learned from me. I went to teach them uh, a little bit about uh, uh, Glocks and M4s because those are two platforms that I have some experience with. They were switching over to, uh, to Glocks and M4s from what they'd been using previously. Um, but I learned so much about tracking, uh, uh, the tactical tracking that a lot of these guys had done in, uh, they were older. So they caught the tail end. First, they'd grown up tracking game to eat, to survive. Um, and then a lot of them caught the tail end of the bush wars. And uh, they learned to take that tracking of animals and turn it into tracking humans. So tactically tracking. So instead of just, you know, not picking your head up uh, and looking around, but you had to do that too, uh, just because of the, the dangerous game out there. But uh, let's say if you're tracking a deer. Uh, or something here uh, and your head's down and you're looking, you're looking, you're looking. Sometimes you're not thinking, you know, about being ambushed by uh, an enemy guerrilla force or something like that. Uh, well, these guys had to think about that uh, in tracking people in the bush wars. So they had that. And then they came back from the bush wars and the government hired a lot of them to work for like a national police force doing what we would think of as CSI, so crime scene investigation. So they took those tracking skills uh, from both uh, the bush tracking animals, uh, from the bush wars tracking humans, uh, tactically tracking humans, and then they brought that to an urban environment and got into that psychology of tracking. So not necessarily like tracking drops of blood, but thinking, hey, where is this person going to go next? Who are their contacts? Where are they most likely to go? Uh, do they need medical attention? Whatever it is, uh, but getting in their head. Um, and then they kind of aged out of that. 
And they've been a lot of them have been hired by these private concessions uh, to protect different animals. And in the case of where I went in South Africa, it was some of the last rhino on earth. So it was really cool to spend time with them. They put me through a little tracking course out there and it was, it was incredible. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the organization that I went over there with, I don't know if they exist anymore, but uh, so I'm going to answer this by saying, stay tuned. Uh, Mike Glover from Fieldcraft Survival might be putting together a little something for this summer. Uh, of course, things can always change, but uh, but we're talking about doing something together over there in this realm um, pretty soon, and hope that hope that works out. And if so, I'll have a lot more information that's more current um, about how uh, Americans can help. So stay tuned. All right, that those were the questions. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, thank you to everybody who took the time uh, to do this. Once again, at Jack Carr USA, at Danger Close Podcast. And we'll do this again and uh, do some more questions in the future, especially as we get closer to the launch of the Terminal List. Starring Chris Pratt coming to Amazon Prime on... No, just kidding. I don't even know what it is now. It's, uh, I think it moved. So it, uh, it can move around a little bit uh, based on a variety of things that are that are going on. So, um, But it's done and it's looking good. And I've seen all the episodes. We've edited all the episodes. So once they're edited, then they go into another part of the post-production process where they get like treatments and visual effects and all that sort of thing. Because you don't want to waste time, money, energy, effort on visual effects if you're just going to edit that part out. So, um, So then I'll see them all again, as the visual effects get uh, uh, put in or taken out, depending on how they're, uh, what they need to do. Uh, and I'll, I'll see them all again with that here, I don't know, in the next uh, month or two. So that'll be cool. And then uh, as far as I know, it's still coming in sometime in 2022. So I will share with you as soon as I can. I'm sure Chris Pratt will as well. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, also, if you want to go to the website, officialjackcar.com is a place where you can look up uh, those reading lists, uh, check out what's going on. You can sign up for the newsletter there as well. So we can stay in contact that way because just like some of the other things we talked about today, um, who knows how long some of the social media companies are going to tolerate people with that might have opposing views. Hmm. Uh, so sign up for the newsletter that might be, uh, around a little longer than some of these other platforms anyway. So, uh, so do that. And in the blood is coming 2022 as well. So May 31st, 2022, you can pre-order that. And if you go to, uh, uh, to Amazon or, uh, Barnes and Noble or Goodreads or whatever, um, and you want to leave a good review, any of your favorite authors would appreciate that. It's a, it's a huge deal, particularly on the, uh, the Amazon side of the house to leave a review, uh, down there and you can read some of the bad ones. I read some of the bad ones here, uh, on some videos I do each month, negative reviews, just pick out a couple to read. And if you want to counter some of those, uh, I'd sure appreciate that the time that it takes to, to do that. Uh, and it, yeah, it means, it means a ton. So Thank you so much. And thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Hit subscribe and I will be back with another episode next week. So uh, take care out there. Stay strong. Be safe. Keep fighting.